So we have 100 plus organizations here in our region that are uh, robotics focused, robotics organizations, whether it's R&D or commercial businesses headquartered here. That's unique. Not very many cities can say that. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Jen Apicella. Uh, Jen is the program director for the Pittsburgh Robotics Network, the president of Build for Windu Tech, which she also started, and also the president of the Pittsburgh chapter of Get With It, uh, which is a nonprofit for women in technology. Jen, welcome to the pod. Jen, hey, thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Happy to have you. Uh, so you started to tell me off camera a little bit about Get With It and what they do. I'm kind of interested in hearing more about that. Yeah, sure. So uh, Get With It is a, uh, it's a national nonprofit organization headquartered out of Columbus, Ohio, and uh, it's chapter driven. So the goal is to create uh, regional communities of women in technology and unify them around sort of the mission of uh, getting women to aspire to enter into tech, but cool. then also to help them ascend once they're in tech as well. Hell yeah. Yeah, it's pretty great. So we've got our Pittsburgh chapter and we've got amazing women who are uh, the committee managers. The board is fully formed now for our chapter. Anyone and, I know just out of curiosity? Or? Um, well, I'd love to see some women from robotics and <laughs> women engineers, but... I mean, happy to make intros. Like. Yeah, yeah. We, we need more engagement. We need more yeah. like really technical women as well as women who are sort of tech adjacent or on the business side of tech. Yeah. Because um, we want to show... The representation right for women so that they don't feel intimidated by it's a clue. tech is business business is tech you could be technical you could be sort of techy you yeah. could be tech savvy you could talk about tech you could build tech there's so many ways to to sort of you know go at that cool um so yeah and the really our mission for that is around um uh, each region does a regional conference every year where we allow women's voices to be amplified and heard and that's where these are region that's right got it that is correct. That is our, our chapter region. So sweet. Yeah. So this year we're sort of off the hook from national. We don't have to do like a formal conference, but we are going to do some type of summit before December, like sometime later in the year. Oh, cool. Yeah. So we're excited. Am I allowed to come or? <laughs> we encourage allies to participate, right? So awesome. I think that the challenge around sort of any kind of, uh, you know, DEI, you know, any sort of um, individual that's trying to break into a space that they're not already, you know, populated in. Um, we need more and more people to get educated about what the challenges are, how they contribute to the the challenges and things they can do to maybe alleviate those challenges. So, Sweet. Yeah. yeah. I mean, anything you do to help, that's, it's weird because I have like a weird relationship with women in tech. Obviously, I'm a man, so it's like I don't really understand it fully. But like I know enough women that work in the field. I mean, hundreds, I think, at this point where it's like I, I hear horrible stories about the shit that you guys have to put up with. Super weird stuff happens, man. Super and, uh, weird Jesus, stuff. Jesus, I'm sorry. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> I think people forget themselves and they, yeah. you know, behave in ways that, you know, I don't know. I guess every, the workplace is a weird thing, right? Especially when it comes to gender or any other kind of like really like anything that separates from you go from human right we're all human correct but then the types of humans that we are we're made up of so many different experiences and components and backgrounds and challenges yeah, yeah. Absolutely. and when those things all culminate and then you have people from different sides of the fence in any fence in any space right that's when we start to see the problems the breakdowns between like privilege or you know um exploitation or assumptions yeah. and stereotypes and just like straight up sexual harassment i mean well there's that too yeah i'm gonna, <laughs> gonna, gonna, gonna call an ace in it you know, but... I, I mean <laughs> like paid paid, i mean <laughs> it's gonna sound bad but like i feel like of the women that i send into sales roles in the robotic sector like i mean so many of them come back to me with stories like spence i can't do it anymore like this <laughs> So sales is an interest. So when I did sales in my background, so prior to the stuff I do now, I did sales at IBM for yeah. years. Yeah, you, that's right. Yeah, and so I you were uh, server systems. No, so uh, software. Okay. So okay. Um, uh, security analytics. Oh, cool. Yeah, it was that's awesome. Kind of exciting. Security intelligence analytics was sort of my, my that field is so mind-boggling to me because I'm such an idiot when it comes to information security. 
Well, mm -hmm. and I'm not an expert either. I, I became more... Well, you have to be to sell it, though. I'm sure you mm -hmm. are more than me. No, listen, here's a secret about sales, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, bad salespeople are experts at nothing and just BS all the time. Correct. Right. Good salespeople get to know the people, right, and the, the customers and what their needs are. But at the end of the day, I had a lot of assumptions about, like, I had to be a product expert. I had to understand how the technology was built. I... I, I didn't have to understand any of that. To be a good salesperson, you have to understand your customer, their industry, and their challenges, and like cool. what they need to succeed. And that's it. If you're focused on that and really advocating for them, you can go back to the well, and you have engineers who can support the technology and answer IT questions. You have leadership who can go in and provide other leadership like assurances around like, Yes, we'll support this. Yes, we will support you as a customer, right? So they give you that company company assurance. Um, but at the end of the day, if you just get those needs right and are honest about what your products and services do and don't do. And what you know and don't know about them, it sounds like. Yeah, and who you can bring to the table to answer those questions. Yeah. Because no one person can be everything in any role, right? The engineer yeah. is usually not great at doing the relationship development and getting those customer needs but we're not all like that <laughs> well, well it's not that they're not bad at it's not that they're sure. bad at it it's just that like we can only focus on so much at one time and yeah. can, and be uh good at being specialists and it's so true. let an engineer specialize in the tech let them shine in that area let them be that specialist and then let the relationship person who's good at communicating and follow-ups and you know, setting up the, you know, all the meetings and everything and getting the right people at the table. Let, yeah. let us shine at that. Well, you have to realize you're talking to a sales engineer. Well, well, right. Well, my sales engineer was like my partner in crime. Like yeah. we went everywhere together. Like our, the sales engineers supported what I did. And so they would field the IT questions. They would manage the IT relationships and they would make sure they understood the product and all the releases and iterations and integrations. Fuck yeah. Yeah. And then I brought them with me to the table when those things needed to happen. And I was the one who convened everyone, you know, around, again, those customer problems, the customer needs. So you were um, like an account manager slash salesperson. That is correct. That's awesome. Yeah. So I managed a portfolio. I had a territory. I had channel partners. Sweet. I used everything at my disposal to make sure my customers got the best possible information, service, and, and even pricing, you know. Yeah, well, you're still pretty good at that. I mean, having interface with PRN via you. Yeah. That event SK sponsored recently. I mean, you, you were a pleasure to work with. Thank you so much. We really, yeah. you did a great job moderating that well, panel. You. It was a joy to have you. Um, and it was the conversation. You gave me some good coaching ahead of time, too. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, you have a podcast. You, you're you fine on camera. Well, I know how to talk to people. But at the same time, I mean, it was good to get some insights and validation. You know, it's a group effort. It takes a village. That's true. Yeah. No, we were, we were happy to have you. That was a great conversation. Um, a lot of people, like, reached out and said really good things about it. Yeah. I, wanna, I haven't done this yet, but I really want to get together and put together like a testimonial reel. Like we have like 10 of them on LinkedIn, just that people said we could use. That's wonderful. So, that's really yeah, people great. People really, really liked it. Well, good. I'm so happy to hear that. And that's the point, right? Like, it, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of what organization I work for, or my title or what my what I'm focused on in any given moment, it's really about success not and not just my success right but like mutually beneficial success which ensures your success yeah i mean so if i'm able to if we're able to lift each other up and help each other out and uh, be curious and genuinely interested in each other's like needs and problems and what's going on and when we can help each other do so right and sometimes we do that wrapped around with like you know a, a check is written and a service is purchased or sure. product I mean, is you know, built. Everybody wants to close a sale. Like, right. That's part of the job. That's how you value someone's time. That's how you yeah. value relationships how and you business. you feed yourself. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But like you should, if we're scoping it accurately, if we're being sincere and we're genuinely excited by the work we do and the conversations yeah. we're having, like, well, that, I love it. The that's stuff I that's do. brilliant. And I, I mean, I think you're right. Like, there are bad salespeople that are short-sighted and they bullshit for lack of a better term um and i've dealt i was trying to buy a property earlier this year and there was this person i was dealing with and she just kept trying to be an expert in things she didn't know anything about and it was very apparent and um, yeah that's a bummer you know i was like hey so i'm trying to buy an investment property i want you know this many units she's like what's your budget she would only show me properties at the very top of my budget that didn't mm. make economic sense and i'm like what's the market like is it students is it you know nurses you know is it like who who were we renting to so I can understand the profile so that we can you know figure out you know how much money we have to budget to keep it replaced to be section eight you know what are we doing here 
you know, she was like, well, you know, I think she was used to selling to people that had an emotional attachment to a property. And so her model was different, but she was trying to play in the space. And, you know, then she was like coming high pressure, like, and you assign this exclusivity thing. And I'm like, you're the one that's giving all of us a bad name and sales. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, and there are different strategies. And I, I do think it depends on a, like a variety of factors. One, the human themselves. If I'm not well aligned as a human, like if I'm not practicing good balance and wellness and like care and, and reflection as a human, then I'm out of alignment. So I'm going to bring that malalignment everywhere I go to every relationship I develop, to every motivation or intention that I have. And so for me as a human, There's it's a lot of insight there. Well, well thanks. Like I, I don't like to, you know, like be careless with my, my, t the investment of time when it comes to relationships. Sure. I think that like, I, I think in all of our, our youth and hopefully we've, we're phasing that out as adults as we grow, yeah. but we've been burned by people who, you know, in our youth, right? We didn't have the knowledge or the understanding. Well, of, you like, hadn't all the been ways. burned yet, so you didn't know how to look out for it. Well, that's a good point. Our weaknesses yeah. are unknown to us until they're revealed through us through folly and like scraps. Correct. That's and, a brilliant way to look at it. Yeah. And so as those things get revealed, instead of having shame or instead of avoidance or instead of blame or instead of like self deprecate, you know, all these terrible things, why not just go like, yeah, everybody's screwed up in some way sure. and everybody's awesome in some way. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I try to kind of put a light on mistakes. I mean, with that event we did with the Pittsburgh Robotics Network on things that go wrong in field robotics and, you know, with this podcast, just trying to be sincere and talk about, you know, the good and the bad and the ugly. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I mean, we're all human. And so I think it's probably helpful to, to shine a light on that and say, look, it, it's possible to do really incredible things, but also fuck up from time to time. Not just possible, but it is like odd if you don't. Yeah. Well, nobody does it, I think is the thing, right? I mean, people right. are good at hiding when they do. And there are some situations where, I mean, the optics are such that you have to present, you know, a, a certain image, you know, but I mean... In reality, I think if you had an honest conversation with a lot of people and, you know, I mean, and you see this when things go kind of south on project, you probably saw this at IBM. I mean, you see it everywhere. Um, you know, I, I've seen it at some of the most prestigious engineering houses in the country mm -hmm. and, and probably in the world. I mean, and, you know, it's just mistakes always happen and it's how you handle them, you know, that separates, you know, like, you know, really good leadership from, you know, just you know, that cloak and dagger mediocrity that just tries to, you know, not hide its existence or whatever. You know? So right. Like, it's so true. It's uh, how we respond to the stimuli around us, right, as humans, as you know, we're confronted with constant things to react to. For sure. Yeah. And I think it's the reactions that we have that we should be measuring and not the outcomes, because the outcomes are sort of a combination of skill and folly and yeah. luck. Well, that's and random, important you know? too. I mean, like for sure, you're, you're getting paid to sort of point toward an outcome or increase the probability of a, a desired outcome, but you can never guarantee an outcome. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cause control is just an illusion. Sure. I'm truly. No, no, I, I agree with you. Um, <laughs> but we still have a measure of it yeah. at different times. But For sure. And I mean, there are guarantees in industry, but I mean, oftentimes the way that's achieved is that the guarantee will take a hit every now and then because they have to do it again if it doesn't work out. And it's just they're the ones that pay for it. Well, and it's interesting too, because my start, I got my start in project management. So I did project management, then global pro program management, oh, cool. and then I did sales at IBM. And because I was there for like a decade, but when I started out in project management, the first things you learn is like, it's not about not, it's not, if you can deliver the project on time and within budget and like with everything intact, great. But it's just as valued to be able to scope risk, report on it, adjust the timelines and communicate to all the stakeholders. Communication is critical. Absolutely. As early and often as possible. I mean, That's totally right. Yeah. And so it's, we weren't measured often on like, was our outcome perfect or was like the way we scoped the project did we end there right that that is great to have it's it's a good win to have you know yeah. when it happens well, i mean it's kind of old school like waterfall right i mean that was the metric at one point yeah but like just being able to adjust accordingly and appropriately and in advance and like notify people and and communicate the right elements right to the right levels there's nuance in that and that's a good project manager, but that's also a good human, right? To be able to do that and scope. Oh, for sure. They, they go hand in hand. Yeah. Like scope your own life and figure out where the risks are and don't like <laughs> screw up that much on purpose or like did you, you know, mitigate things. Did you ever see that JIRA video where it's a JIRA um, 
salesperson and he's talking about Thanksgiving dinner and he puts it into Jira. No, <laughs> so you gotta I get the turkey about, with the sour. I thought you were talking about the rural juror from rural juror from uh, uh, from Thirty Rock. Uh, I don't know that rural, one. I can't even say it. Rural juror was. The, <laughs> it was Same, but an Alaskan product. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's a weird reference, but yeah. No, that's funny. Yeah, I thought so. I mean, you know. Yeah. More of a Trello guy myself, but I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, you know, it's funny doing all this sort of um, getting out of this cor the corporate environment and getting more into these community building groups and stuff. Um, I love industry. I actually didn't do that on purpose. It just sort of happened that way. But yeah. Um, I miss those, like the team tools and like, you know what I mean? The, 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 you can't use those in, in community building. Well, you can, but like, I don't work for a company that's like a hundred or a thousand or like, you know, these large organizations. Yeah, but Kanban's pretty, I mean, you know, you can do pretty small scale projects with that. You can. Yeah. So all these tools that we could totally, yeah, totally could use and invest in. But I think that I got more exposure to like enterprise level oh, tools I gotcha, and team I gotcha. tools where you're like working and collaborating in teams of like, you know, five, 10, 20, 30 or more people on the same project. Yeah. And you well, need we do those that too. tools. That makes sense. I miss it. I miss, I miss it a lot. I, um, a lot of people think I'm like an entrepreneur or like I'm somehow like, you know, I mean, Oh, kind like, of are. I'm totally not. I'm a team person, a hundred percent. Can you be both though? I mean, like entrepreneur just means you started your own thing at one point, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I am probably more like a consultant at heart, right? So while I can work on it, I work best with team and strategy and like scoping and like operations and then relationships, all things good consultants do. Yeah. But like, I could also just do it for a company, right? Where they, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean? So I don't need to be like freelance and control loads of my money. destiny. Yeah. Like yeah. it's, it just depends. Like, so I've been, you know, I like the consulting work I I'm doing. I, I like all these different things I'm doing. And, but part of me does also miss working for a business in industry where it's like, this is your job. You're on this department. This is your role. Strategically you do this operationally, you do this and it's like, great. And then everybody else worries about all the other weird stuff. Yeah, yeah. There's so much crap that I kind of wish I didn't have to do as a business. Uh, yeah, you have to wear so many hats. Manager. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mainly it's the books, if I'm being honest. <laughs> I think that's the one that every business owner hates. Yeah, um, that's like rule number one to outsource. Like the first well, thing you outsource is yes like no. so the accounting. <laughs> I've made the mistake of outsourcing it too much. And the problem when you outsource the accounting completely is that you lose sight of your finances and where money is going. At least in my case, I got kind of stupid with it. Yeah. And so I, I was allowing money to be spent frivolously. We actually got robbed by, mm. by some people. So we had uh, an administrative uh, person that, that stole, luckily not that much, but a few thousand dollars. Just, you know, kind of little by little That's buying personal stuff with company credit cards. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We recovered the loss. <laughs> but, um, yeah. you know, it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant to do so. I mean, I kind of took it on as a special project at one point. But uh, yeah, that would feel very violating, though. That's, like... that's, well, that's why I took it on as a project. I wanted to sort of, you know, salvage my own ego. It was, it was kind of stupid. I, I was making less than Burger King wages for the amount of money I recovered. But, mm. you know, I don't know. I wasn't one I wanted to just turn over the credit card company. I wanted to personally see it through. Yeah, that's really challenging. Yeah, I think it's hard. It is hard to. That is the one thing that I don't miss about teams or working on it. A big team or a large company is that you can't control who you work with. Like, well, the biggest betrayal, you sort of, I mean, I hired all these people personally. <laughs> like, that's the thing. Like, but yeah, hiring someone is different than like, you know, because you can remove them from the picture. You sure. have the ability to do that. Whereas if you're like, um, you know, as a consultant or doing the work that I do, like sometimes I can pick and choose who I spend time with or who I am working with collaboratively. When you're right, I can't get rid of somebody at one of our clients if, if I don't like working with them. Right. But you can also decide not to work with a client. If, that's that's always true. Yeah. So, um, and that, that's something like I've said no to lots of things because either the project itself was not what I felt was challenging or in alignment with my, what, with what I'm passionate about. And I know that I need that level of excitement and motivation to do Same. a good job. Yeah. Um, so I've said no to stuff and I've said yes to plenty of things that, 
I'm like, why did I say yes? To this? <laughs> what is wrong? But now you've said yes, and as a responsible adult, you have to see it through. I That's mean, right. Yeah. Reputationally, you want to continue to perform. Under also, just ethically, like if it. if I say I do something, that is a very important thing for me. It's like I now I have to do it, you know, even if it's miserable. Yeah, I, I mean, said I was going to. So you yeah, know, there's no getting around that. It's it's true. Yeah, I mean, yeah. When I make a commitment, I do follow through on that all the time, and then I just try and find the silver lining and like. You know what I mean? That's, I'm like yeah, same. desperate for the fumes of inspiration and like motivation. <laughs> like I find them in any little detail where I'm like, why, you know, why am I spending so much time on this little thing? That's such a small component of the project. It's the only thing that's giving me life right now. Like That's hilarious. <laughs> I know the feeling there's been plenty of times when I've just been like, I don't want to do this. But then sometimes you're doing something and you feel that way and you look at the amount of money that's coming in and you're like, oh, that's why I did this. Yeah. No, that's different, right? That's, yeah. that's a different kind of inspiration. Yeah, like sometimes I, yeah. I mean, but uh, I, I, it has to be a pretty large sum of money for me to like really be motivated by I'm it. I'm not going to name numbers because that's tacky. <laughs> but I have my, I have my, I have my price as well. Yeah. And I, well, it's funny because when I did sales, I'm more of a consultative salesperson, right? Sure. Like the problem solver, the like a lot of the deals I did were, you know, upwards of, you know, going into the seven figures or solidly yeah. into the seven figures. And so when you do stuff like that, you know, you just sort of, you have to be more, uh, less transactional and more like thinking about the full scope and scale of everything. And so from those conversations, like it's less coin operated. So interesting. Well, for me, what motivated me and how I met my quota every time or knocked my quota out of the water was through making partnerships and being inspired by building an ecosystem around like making sure people knew that our technology like was out there to help them, That's you know, good sales. Well, yeah. And so like any, if I talk to a customer and they're like, hey, yeah. And I'm, they're like, do you so what do you what does your technology do? And then like, this was the analogy I give all the time. I'm like, well, I could tell you it's a toaster that'll paint your house. <laughs> <laughs> but like, if anyone's trying to tell you they have a technology that like can toast beautiful, perfect toast that's crisp and lightly, you know, just the butter goes right on it, lovely and it's mm. And then it also paints your house so evenly and beautifully. You should be skeptical because I don't know of any technology that's there from a maturity standpoint, you know, yeah, for sure. today. That's asking too much of something. That's being that's unrealistic expectations, that's, utopian. That's a really good sales concept. story, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but I'll tell people that like whatever it is in my portfolio, is it more solid on the toast side or is it more solid on the house painting side? And while we can integrate with things that will then help this toaster, you know, solve your house painting problems, yeah. I'll probably bring, be bringing in either another technology or another service provider to yeah. custom build an integration. Maybe buy a toaster like, and hire a painter, you know, rather than trying to get the one thing to do both. Exactly. And so my strategy was just be honest with the customer. If your portfolio is a toaster and it doesn't paint houses, but you know of amazing house painters, be that value add, be that provider. And if I get compensated commission wise on the toaster part, but I'm actually better at the house painting part, then say that because next year when their budget is for house painting, they're going to call you up next year and you don't need your time wasted by trying to like square peg round hole. Yeah, something. when I found that too. And they I don't mean, want it either. It's definitely like earlier in my career, I used to kind of bullshit people. I'll just be honest mm -hmm. um, because I didn't know any better. Right. You know, I thought, you know, it's like, Follies I got of youth. Yeah, exactly. You know, I gotta, <laughs> I gotta, you know, get territory. I gotta, you know, do it all. I'm going to try to, you know, be good at everything. And it's total horse crap because yeah. at the end of the day, you know, I mean, you're good at what you're good at. I mean, you can certainly build other skill sets, but you know, you don't want to try to sell outside your strengths because you're not building trust when you do that. That's right. And one of my, all, my other things is when I look for a sales position, I don't ever want to sell something that people don't want. Yeah. You know, you're not going to catch me like dialing for dollars, selling people light bulbs, you know, or like, you know, just like nonsense, right? That yeah. people can get, can, they can get themselves and you have to convince them. So, I mean, I think that that's the problem is a lot of people either one sales culture is bad. And yeah. so from a top down perspective, they're overly, uh, I wouldn't aggressive. say sales culture is universally bad, but some industry or some companies for sure have a bad sales culture. Yeah. If you're looking to go into sales, I, and women in tech, I always tell them this. I'm like, if you're a project manager and you love conversations and you love relationship development, go into sales. And they're always like, Oh, quota and Oh, sales. And, oh, I don't want to be gross. Sales is yeah, force exactly. people to do things. And that's I'm the like, connotation to engineers and program managers and project managers. That's right. And so I'm like, you know, if you like, if you're good at communication and you're good at relationship building and you genuinely like helping people, 
and those skills can be applied to that, then you should go into sales, but find the right product solution services, find the right sales culture that yep. teaches their team. Like they set reasonable quotas. They tell their team, like, don't just like spam people, like unapologetically, you well, know, so like, many, so many do that though. I mean, yes. that's the thing. Yeah. And then like, I'll, I'll get those cold emails that are just spammy and, and crappy. And it's like, I've even used CRMs that encourage you to do that. You know, like we had an Insightly uh, subscription at one point and they would be like, use this script. I'd be like, no fucking way. (laughs) (laughs) Well, here's the thing, because those strategies can work. That's the thing. If you focus on intention rather than outcome, we talked, we talked about this earlier, right? Is that if you're just looking for outcome, if you're just looking for like wins, yes. It's, and, and I hate this, I hate this analogy because it's kind of like maybe slightly sexist or super not like, you know, PC right now, but like, um, whatever, I'm a Gen Xer, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> but like, you know, they always talk about like, you know, if you're a woman, you're used to being hit on at the bar, right? And there's always that guy who will just hit on literally every female in the bar. Yeah, and, numbers game. That was a 90s thing. Yeah, I think we've talked about this. I use, yeah. I use this analogy often too. So it's like, okay, great. So he doesn't care or, you know, that person doesn't care how many times they've gotten rejected as long as they get that win that one yes and they don't care what their intention or perception or reputation is yeah along the way they're just focused on the outcome that's short-sighted because they yeah, built myopic. they built a terrible reputation every time that person shows up at the bar now they're known as the sleazy gross person who doesn't care about humans and is just focused on an outcome they're self-centered right yeah but they're myopic right in the sense that the outcome is all they care about and um so if that's all you're measuring that's a bad sales culture that's a bad you know you know that's a bad not just sales culture but if you're only focused on outcomes as a leader well imagine like the the turnover and those types of sales teams i mean big big turnover. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then we hate all the people and the products they represent when we're getting on the receiving end. If you've ever been a decision maker and you're getting all that stuff. Oh, that's what I'm talking about, right? You're like, screw this company. I don't want to talk to them because they have bad You'll send them an email every now and then you'll be like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, why why are you doing this? What are you trying to accomplish here? Totally. Or, you know, like, is there an alignment? Is there a real thing? Like, what are you attempting to accomplish here? That's right. You know, and then they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm and they'll, they'll just like you know they'll squirm like a million different ways and you know get all weird with it you know just like get out of here but right. <laughs> yeah. well and sales culture is adapting because buyers especially for technology sales buyers are becoming more savvy in technology purchases and implementations and they have more decades of experience with realistic outcomes so everybody knows that toasters don't paint houses yeah. and house painters don't make good toasters <laughs> they just know this now yeah. so when you come like a wolf in sheep's clothing and you're trying to like do that scam you just look gross and nobody believes you there was something really effective we did today um and it was it was a sales meeting and all i did was ask what the what the prospect wanted and then brought the best engineers i had that could do the things that they wanted mm-hmm. to the meeting and said why don't you guys just talk about it <laughs> <That's> right <laughs> why don't we just solve this problem practically? and they could not <laughs> wait to have the next meeting yeah. <laughs> that's exactly it like you just let you know, you let your strengths solve your problems and you uh and you have to be humbled too i think you know I agree. a lot of my time a lot of the time i was not afraid as a salesperson and this i did not start this way when I started, I was nervous and I was like, oh, I have to know everything. Oh, we all are. I have to do that. I fortunately had great mentors. I had some spectacular sales mentors. To be honest, Sam, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have had that. Yeah. Prior to that, though, I would have made all the same mistakes that you see that the stereotypes support, right? Without a, these mentors. Well, I think were you think you're supposed amazing. to be that guy, you know, it's, yeah. it's the problem, you know, and I mean, the, the same is true of like the toxic male cult, like not to get too meta or weird with it, but. Yeah. I mean, you know, growing up in the 90s, I mean, you get these stupid relationship advice from your friends and you're just like, I guess, I mean, if that's what I'm supposed to do. You <laughs> Meanwhile, know. they're just making it up, of like course. talking they're, their ass and, and they're, and they're screwing you and themselves over and, and everybody else and right. the person you're with. And the, like, it's just like, I wish I hadn't listened to that person. This is asinine. Yeah. That's right. That's right. But the mentors I had, were they were, and they were all men, um, you know, so as a woman going into sales, um, while I was on a team that was all men, the, the mentors that I had were, um, I really just can't speak highly enough. I, they changed my life. That's awesome. Yeah, they really got, they-, they What were they, some of the most important lessons you feel like you got out of that? So that's a good question. Um, Thank you. The, um, 
the well, one, they were senior, they were very experienced. And because they were sort of, I don't want to say toward the ends of their career, because many of them are still very, very active in their careers. But yeah. the leader that we had, um, the lessons that they taught me were one, you don't like being lied to, so don't lie to others. Nice. Like right out the gate. Don't pretend, yeah. don't fake it. Okay. Two, there's a myth. As a salesperson, you feel like you have to like know everything. So similar to your your example of the real estate agent who was trying to like be a know-it-all and trying to like, you know, like Yeah, she just made herself look bad. Exactly. People we look, we can sense that. So have empathy, which was amazing to have these older white males talk about having empathy in the sales yeah. process, right? But it's because At the end of the day, it, we're all humans. I mean, like you said. Well, and they're focused on outcomes. So yeah. <laughs> they want to make the sales. So yeah. they learned in their career that like you have to care more about what keeps the customer up at night. Yeah. What at the end of the day is ruining their work life balance or their day or their like like what is driving them to make change? Because change is a pain in the ass. Buying tech and then implementing for a team, especially in an enterprise. It's expensive as shit, too. It's expensive. It takes like nine months long on average like sometimes six sometimes 12 you know what i mean sure yeah i mean that's our typical project cycle as well yeah and then once you implement it then there's all sorts of experiential nuances that like didn't get brought up in the pre-scoping sales cycle process that you oh, didn't yeah. even think to ask about that you just like made assumptions in the back well, of your mind you get better at it though like i'm sure this was true in your career as well like i mean i i feel like these days i hear certain things and so one of the ones that's kind of a red flag is this is going to be really simple. Don't worry about it. Straightforward job. I'm like, never is. <laughs> right. What are we missing here? You know, right. let's, let's drill into this. And so. Yeah. Having evolved sales, tech sales now in, in bulk. Right? So many people have been doing this for decades. They've been implementing things. And so they know that every tech solution implementation is going to fall down somehow, some way, some aspect of it is not going to be what they thought they're going to find a way that it sucks right so if you can sort of like out the gate just be like again that toaster painter analogy like this makes great toast it doesn't paint your house right um but then they may ask some gray area in between right so like well uh does it air fry like it doesn't you know what i mean like can i butter the toast first and then put it in and then what would happen right you know what would start yeah. a fire like what would happen like yeah and some of those things are experimental and you have to sort of say like that's a great question Let's bring the engineer in and let them talk to you about it. Like we've never tried that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But if we schedule downtime on a Saturday, we can run the experiment. Right. Can you give me some looking... dummy data and we'll put yeah. together a little, you know, mini demo and we'll like run a little like POC, proof of concept. And, yeah. and let's, let's explore that, you know. Um, so and, and if you have good people, like they should be able to, again, mitigate risk, talk about those things. Um, but it's not really until you go live with it to implement it that they start to see. But the joy about that is, is because these things have been happening now for some time and tech yeah. business solutions and all that is, is mature. They know that your solution, your services, whatever it is, it's going to happen. Well, sophisticated clients now. I think most clients yeah. know that something is not, it's not going to be a hundred percent solve miracle solution. Yeah. It's going to hopefully just do X, Y, and Z as you discussed, as you expected as you scoped, you know, as you presented. Yeah. And if you did a good job as a team. That's a good point. Yeah, you're right. And that, that does come down to comms and managing expectations. And being really savvy at identifying what's important to your customer. So if you've zeroed in on the XYZ and you know you can deliver solid, like knock their socks off on XYZ, then the A through, what is <laughs> I'm trying to get a concrete example here, John. You know, so. like you know what I mean. Like then, then the A through you know, T U V W X. Yeah, W. The A through W is you just have to do that like somewhat. So what I think you're saying is, if you knock out this thing over here, um, and that's the thing that's most important to your client, then these things are secondary, and that's you right. don't have to have the same sort of results or delivery on, on the secondary action items. They're willing to take the gray area. They're willing to take all the nuance that comes with that. Like, and they know that it won't, but those are the key priorities for them. Yeah. Those are their, either their KPIs or you know, that's where they're going to get the biggest ROI. Mm -hmm. I hate to use all these acronyms that are so annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Business. What key, is KPI again? Key performance indicators. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So like ROI, the consulting uh, groups use that, like the Lloyd Accenture. That's, that's big for them. Yeah. So for me, my, my biggest thing as a relationship business development person, I would take out my clients and I would say, at the end of the day, what's going to get you promoted? 
what can I do to help you show your company that this project that you are recommending that they implement, that this technology that you want to bring onto your team, not only like gives you that ROI, the, you know, the return on the investment, but like what's going to make you look great for your boss? What's going to make your department look elevated for the company? Like, how can I help you do that? She would go so far as to get into their politics and try to assist. Yeah. Huh? No, that's, yeah, that's cool. And they, they would share with me, you know, like, oh, my gosh, if I could just like show up every day and like have this dashboard that was also attached to that, I'm like, done easily, you know, now that you've, you know, so if you take the time to uncover what's important to your customer, again, help them succeed as individuals, as humans, but as a team and as business roles, yeah. right? Because the tech's going to do stuff. It's going to do things, you know, like that's why it was built it's a tool right people don't build hammers and then hang them on the walls art well Although you can you can i you mean can. hipsters do that all the time you could sure <laughs> but it was if it's purpose built and it's yeah. it was built for a purpose then let it rock its purpose show it off and like make sure your customer wants that purpose and needs that purpose to to help them achieve success i, I like that the question you drilled into the the like what's going to get you promoted because that's it's different than asking, you know, what's important to the company. It's what's important to you personally. That's right. And you're getting a different perspective, which is which is good because I think it's both are important, right? But you want to understand all the angles so you can come up with the intersection. Yeah, because we all know, like every company has politics. Every company has those nuances. Yeah. yeah, it's it's just part of the world, right? So it's like. Yes, you can. Oh, okay, I, we implemented this project, and now we're more efficient. We have operational efficiency, and blah blah. blah you know all the stuff, and people are like, great checks a box, but you don't get raises. You don't yeah. excel and ascend into leadership because you checked a box. You excel and ascend into leadership because you knock someone's socks off. Cause yeah, you rock. Usually, because you're quick on your feet and you did well in a tumultuous circumstance. Yeah, and so for me, it's sort of like if I could know how to make my customer rock it. And then they get promoted, and then they have even more decision-making power. I mean, win-win. I'm seeing that in my career, too, now. And so what yeah. I've noticed is a lot of the people I befriended, like, five years ago are ascending, you know, and, and those people are coming back and saying, hey, you know, yeah. help me out. <laughs> <laughs> I have more leverage now. I can bring you in. Yeah. You can solve problems. Like, yeah. And, then, and again, it's that relationship building where you build trust. You say, like, you know, when you talk to me, you're going to get legit information, like, you know, if I can't help you, I'm not going to promise I can. Correct. Yeah. Or at least you'd be needed if you did. Yeah. And I'm a referral queen. So if I can't help you, I will refer. I will send someone your way who can do X, who can do Y, or I'll try and make connections happen for people. Because if I can't, I don't need to do it. I don't need to be the star of anything, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's important, I think, for me, too. It's like I'd much rather, you know, kind of be in the shadows, you know, just helping out than being, you know, on a You would podium. not much rather be in the shadows. You love, I think you love the light. You're I such a charismatic person. That's yeah. nice of you to say. Yeah. I mean, that's a learned skill, though. Like, I was a very awkward kid. You Were know? you really? I was. I mean, I, I did everything I could to distance myself from being a sort of nerd. Because, again, I grew up in the 90s. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, would... I don't know, like play hooky in school and, and do all this stuff. And, you know, I was also the valedictorian. <laughs> but, you know, I would, I would try to also be cool. Like these were different points, you know? Yeah. So like, um, nerds weren't cool in the nineties. No, they weren't. You'd get no. a wedgie and you'd get made fun of and, you know, nobody would ever want to have sex with you. And so I was just, <laughs> which is basically hell in teenage years. Yeah. yeah that's which like is the worst thing that could ever happen. But it's happen. ironic because now it's like people are pretending to be nerds, you know, when they're not like, I was on a date with someone the other day and they came with like glasses that were taped. It didn't have any. No prescription. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, well, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. Well, have you seen the braces that you can put on that are, are you fake? Fucking serious? Yeah. They have like fake braces now. Like, this is eroding my faith in humanity. <laughs> <laughs> can yeah. I pour you one of these, by the way? I think you'd really like this one. Yeah, let me try it. That sounds good. Which one is this? This is the. This is a smooth amble or contradiction. So they're not paying us for ads, but we'll do it anyway. <laughs> um, one of my friends got me this for my birthday last year. Uh, it's 92 proof, but you cannot tell. Um, it's super delicious proof? in my opinion. Yeah. Well, so it's coming off of, so whistle pig rye. Deli my mouth wateringly delicious. I like it so much as well. So uh, rye to bourbon, so a little bit sweeter. Okay. No problem. And then, um, but like not, not a bad glass. What do you think? 
Oh, I didn't taste it. Yet. I'm gonna cleanse oh, my palate. My my mistake. <laughs> I was like, I just downed the last I, I was of the other one. mine, and I I looked the other way. <laughs> What's good about this location, by the way, is there are hiking trails near here. So if we do drink too much, you can walk it, walk it off. Yeah, <laughs> walk it off. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. I've done it like a bunch of these episodes, to be honest. Yeah, we we drink a lot on the show. So, was that one of the streetcar? Was that one of the things on the rails? That was. Uh, we put in some filtering, but I don't know how effective it is now because we just redid the setup again for the nth time. It's kind of a cool thing, though, to say that we're on the South Side slopes, in that Pittsburgh, we're right yeah. by the trolley. Well, the fact that, that there's trolleys, that's a very Pittsburgh thing to have. That's a cool thing. Yeah. It's like a really cool thing. Like Pittsburgh or San Francisco, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. You don't see many other cities. That's true. One of the first times I went to San Francisco. Boston, maybe? Does Boston have... Just... They have trackless trolleys, so it's a, it's a bus that has power from above. Okay. Which isn't really a trolley. Not really. No. Not quite the same. <laughs> Well, the first time I went to San Francisco, I um I didn't I knew that it was hilly from like seeing like things on, iconic things on movies or TV or whatever, but like driving it was the you're first... in a cloud. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and, and like Pittsburgh has tons of like the topography of Pittsburgh is also very unique in that way, but it's different, right? The landscape is different, like the skyline. Is the altitude's probably not quite as high, right? Yeah. But like some of the streets where I would go down, and it was like. Like, we have, like, Cardiac Hill in Oakland and, like, just different things like that. But oh, Cardiac shit. Hill? You didn't know that? Is that the one with... The pre um, Lothrop, Presby? Yep, I know it. So I skied down that when I was a pit student. What? Yeah, I had skis, and it was Snowpocalypse, if you remember that. I remember Snowpocalypse. Like, 2012? I don't remember the date, but I totally remember Snowpocalypse. But I strapped on skis, and I was skiing down that hill, like, down Lothrop. That's terrifying. How, yeah. would, you, how would you control your stop at the end? Well, so it was all, it was so, so much snow that you, you would just, it was just straight up skiing. You just hiked up the top and you, you would just. When you would go down, but Fifth Avenue is right there with all the. Well, yeah, yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm a decent skier. I've been doing it for decades. So you so. not stop. Yeah, exactly. So you just. Uh, you know. Okay, I'm like pizza french fry. I'm like. Yeah. <laughs> South Park. <laughs> you're you're going to have a bad time. Yeah, like... exactly. I watched that episode last night. <laughs> <laughs> if you french fry, what is it? If you french fry, would you, you french fry when you try pizza? <laughs> you're going to have a bad, bad time. time. <laughs> Darsh. Who is Heather? <laughs> I don't even know this person. <laughs> I love satire. I, you know, it's funny because like South Park. Yeah, I, I, you know, like fifty percent of the time it's just like funny, like irreverent, like whatever. But well, it, it's very much more clever than that. I think some seasons have blown my mind. Agreed. Like. And maybe this is a little personal, like in terms of like, uh, I'll, sh I'll share a, a story if you don't mind. Yeah, we can but... edit it out if you want later. Okay. Well, no, you can keep it. It's fine. Because yeah. it's not it's not really a personal viewpoint or belief. But like, so there was an episode that like really blew my mind and um, just impressed me from a satire perspective. And it was around. I've seen them all. Okay. Then you're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. You're going to be like, yeah, that was a good one. Um, Probably like five times each, if I'm being honest. Yeah, it's me too. Like I've watched them constantly. It's awesome. So um, it was the episode where Cartman throws himself Stand off a Marsh building. Stand Darsh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Darsh. Yeah. Darsh. Um, <laughs> the, um, the one I'm talking about, though, is where Cartman throws himself off a building and because he's trying to go back to the Founding Fathers. <laughs> and have a With the Tebow. He's got the Tebow in the bathtub. <laughs> and he's trying to he has a quite history channel. <laughs> Forget about the building bit, though. i got to rewatch that. It's so good. The reason why it was so good is at the time I'd watched it live when it aired, like, and it was, they're so topical, right? A lot of the stuff they used to do. And he's like repeating himself. He's like, back then, back then, yeah. back then. Yeah. Doodle, doodle, doodle. And, <laughs> and so, um, and the whole episode was around, I think at the time there was a conflict politically, right? Where like the town was split, like Stan's dad was like, we're, you know. Little big country. Well, that was his, um, no, that was. Um, is that the same episode or is that a different one? It's the same episode, but okay. that was not Stan's dad. It was Jimbo. The Jimbo. Yeah. So Jimbo I'm was a like, little bit rock and roll. That was Stan's dad. Yeah. Rock and roll. Like, yeah. He was like the liberal, like more hippie. And the country movement. was the conservative side. That's yeah. right. So these colors don't run and like all that. Yeah. And so it was around. This was around the Iraq War, I think. So I wasn't sure if it was the Iraq War or if it was some type of like election. It must have been the Iraq War. Or you know what? Maybe it was around 9 11. No, it was around 9 11 and like invading Afghanistan and. Which was kind of, I don't know, we've been at war with the Middle East off and on, intermittent, for, sure. for like ever, but. Since the, um, maybe the 50s? Yeah. 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 So. Well, I mean, it wasn't before, you know, 
World War Two, but it was after that for sure. <laughs> Definitely after World War Two yeah. for sure. But like, so the but the point was is that the reason why the episode was so like just beautiful to me was the outcome right at the end right so cartman went back in time and he learned about <laughs> like if he talked to the founding fathers and he saw what their intentions were and, like, that was so funny too like them. the voices they gave those guys so like... funny yeah. so funny and like what they had to focus on and we, we don't need to like do a summary recap of the whole yeah, episode of course. but my personal takeaway was gonna rewatch that later tonight. you should yeah watch this one because it like explosions in my brain so they had the the fight right between the liberal hippies and then the country and they were sort of like doing us they were doing like a face-off like a like a almost like a sing-off right yeah, yeah, the I remember that. they were in yeah. conflict with each other and then cartman comes at the end of the episode and he's like wait wait, wait God, i talked to the founding fathers because they were always like what would our founding fathers say right now about this and he's like they would say we're the right or we're the right yeah, and he's yeah, like, and... no, no, he's like, I did talk to them. And what we've learned at the end of the day is that we're a country that can both like, you know, yes, we can like keep third world countries like, you know, uh, in their place and we can like exploit them for raw materials and we can like have our way with them and be a, a superpower. But we can also like say that that's wrong at the same time. And so we can have, have our cake and eat it too. too. Yeah. And so the country was set up that we could like we can protest war, but at the same time exploit others globally and benefit from it as a country for like our you know quality of life and like our standard of living and like and it was like oh my god, we're the worst. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but also like evil genius like yeah. you know what i mean because it's sort of like how do we not have to have any consequences or sacrifices or like what how do we just allow protest win 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 all the yeah. time but like so it's interesting because it's Colin Quinn had a really good about bit about that um i think it was red state blue state um that it, that it was unconstitutional but i don't know if you're familiar with this comedy at all i don't think so so no. he's pretty brilliant so i mean um, i might know him to see him i'm really bad with names no it's all right um so uh basically what he does is he's got three bits on netflix so it's uh, new york story um unconstitutional and red state blue state new york story is like the history of new york so it's like a motif but with jokes um red state blue state is like we're gonna have a civil war you know and it's it's about you know the republican versus democrat thing mm -hmm. and then um unconstitutional is about the history of the founding fathers and the constitution and so interesting it's interesting yeah it really is like the guy just reads history books and then comes up with these routines and then it's like broadway level set design it's it's really interesting send me this i'd love to yeah yeah check it out absolutely uh it's all on netflix but I, i'll if you remind me i will send it to you yeah and um it's really good but he's got this one bit where he's like um talking about the founding fathers and he's like um you know, um, you could never boo a king. You know, like in in, in Britain, in Britain, you couldn't boo the king. Boo! Guy must be suicidal. You know, like one one archer is like, "Don't worry, I got him." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. The monarchy was vicious. It's true. Exactly, but like you know, in in you know in uh, you know like uh, colonial America, it was like, "Boo! All right, hear him out." He's got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. make sure he never works in this town like yeah it's just like just like yeah he's got nothing let him let it go like yeah. whatever it does no harm to me you know yeah. so. well no it's true like they took i i think right the way of like so we, we evolved from taking people's literal lives to just making it so that they couldn't have quality lives right and yeah. so like and and whether they did that through like specific or it, just let them talk themselves into a grave right i mean if somebody is just true. talking in a circular way it's like just let them go yeah that's true it doesn't do any harm but interesting i'd love to check that out that would be super super neat yeah no it's 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 really good like i, I think you would enjoy it yeah it's uh it's definitely in the spirit of south park <laughs> yeah well so satire was one of the i think it was and i've always loved satire i remember like even in high school like through like my you know english stuff finding and, and realizing like oh my gosh i love this and then in college i took several classes on satire and um yeah my college ex my call i like started out majoring in molecular biology yeah yeah i was so i was a math and science overachiever young person Same. Yeah. yeah um but as a female growing up really really poor in southwestern pennsylvania and like a, in a you know, from a family that like you know, my, my parents didn't go to college and, you know, that kind of thing, but they were actually first generation immigrants. So oh, cool. We're from, yeah. 
So, um, my father's parents, my father, I'm not my background. I'm actually pretty clean cut, uh, 75% Polish, 25% Italian. Oh, cool. Yeah. My mom's a hundred percent Polish and my father's 50, 50 Polish Italian. Neat. Yeah. But he was so. a first gen immigrant. So first gen, is that, how, is that correct? Like that's how they referred to themselves. That's when so, you move over here, right? So he was the first one born here. He was the first generation to be born I would born think of here. it as a second gen, but that maybe I'm getting it wrong. Well, maybe I'm getting it wrong. I don't know. So they always referred to themselves as first generation because they were the first generation to be born here. Yeah. And so their parents- So I have friends that like moved here from Russia and they'll call themselves first generation. Okay. Well, maybe that's more accurate. Yeah. yeah. Like I, I have no, I have, I have no idea. I just know like that's what they, they had said to me. So, but like, you know, their parents, so it's like. They're not infallible. So, yeah. but, um, so my grandparents, not. <laughs> yeah, my grandparents moved here from their respective countries when they were in their teens. And so my parents were the first one. They were, they were born. Here. That's cool. Um, yeah. Like, so great, like, great grandparents moved to Pittsburgh. Well, yeah. And they're not, yes. Yeah, from Southwestern Pennsylvania. So yeah. Pittsburgh adjacent. No, that's cool. Uh, Fayette County, right? Fayette County. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So growing up around there, but like growing, yeah, growing up, um, you know, uh, I, I didn't have in, in the age that I'm at, I don't want to age myself too much, You don't have to. but like, but it's okay. Uh, <laughs> in the spirit of honesty, right. You know, we didn't have the, you know, internet or cell phones or, I mean, I had a word processor that I got like my senior year, which I upgraded from a typewriter, Nice. you know? And so there what was kind of typewriter were you using? Oh, I don't remember. I had typewriters, so that's why. It I'm... was like just some typewriter that we had. I think I had an house. IBM of some kind. I have no it idea. It was nice. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, I don't know. My, my family was fairly well off. My, my dad's a doctor. My mom's a lawyer. But like, so I got, I got like a, a IBM nice... Electra typewriter. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure we did not have that. No, I remember like the, there were a couple of keys that didn't work very well. And so like. Sometimes I would use my sentence and word choice so that I wouldn't like use <laughs> those letters so often. It was That's actually, actually really clever. Well, it was Q, which is okay to like not have to use Q too much. Yeah, Q is not common. But T. Ah, oh, it sucks. Yeah, so the T was the a little is buggy. out. Uh, yeah, so like it would work sometimes, but like sometimes I'd have to go back with a pen and I'd have to like really like. So you just wouldn't get a good imprint. It. Like it would, it would do the click, but you wouldn't get a good imprint. Sometimes it wouldn't do almost anything at all. And then other times I would get a good image. You were the ones so... that like swung out. Yes. I missed those. Yeah. With that the was ribbons. Like, and, yeah. yeah. They're really satisfying. I loved it. I loved it. Have I, I showed you the keyboard here? That. Like this is, um, it's typewriter. You told me oh, yeah. about that. Yeah, That's right? awesome. That's super fun. It, uh, it reminds me of those days. So it's, it's very hipster. But, yeah. yeah like no, that's cool. Is it loud when you type? Yeah. So if, um, if I go here. Oh yeah, yeah. That's super loud. There's something really satisfying about typing really loud. I don't know why. I, I like it too. I, um, yeah. I have a tactile keyboard at home and, um, my cat, uh, was, she'll always jump on my lap when I'm on meetings, when I'm in my home office, you've seen it when you've been in meetings with me. And so, um, and she's done it during like presentations. I'm giving like a recorded talks for like prestigious pre trade organizations. And my cat will just jump on my lap. Like, yeah. Just appearance, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, you know what? You have at it, buddy. It's what happens. It's, yeah, exactly. You're not uncommon in that but, regard. But she, she like tail swiped a glass of water onto my other keyboard. And that's also a mechanical keyboard, so it was it's like super loud and clicky, and I really like it. And um, so, I, but I had to switch because she spilled soda water into it, which is more conductive than regular water. Oh. And so um, I'm just like, all right. And so I, I swapped out just a regular Dell stock keyboard, and I was like really sad. I was like, ah, it's not making a noise. Uh, yeah. yeah, I like the and noise. No and feedback. I, and I know that's obnoxious when you're in public places to be like. <laughs> Well, you don't have that on your laptop, though. It's like, come on. I do have it on my, my laptop. What, you do? Well, for whatever reason, my laptop's pretty clicky. Yeah? But I like that tactile response. Um, I have a... What do I have? I have a Dell, I think. Oh, nice. Yeah. I didn't know they were um, making those now. I have a Dell. Well, I love... So I love my laptop. Like, but I... You know, I have very specific specifications when I purchase any kind of... Anything. I stopped buying Dells because I got a crappy one back in the day. It's a Dell. Yeah, and it, but I mean, is it a, I'm guessing that's a business line one. I don't know. It's like a touch screen. It does like the whole thing where you like you can present. Like, that's cool. Flip it. It's uh, it's yeah. got like a stylus in it and stuff. And like the um, the keyboard. It's not as loud as yours. It's not as tactile as yours. But um, 
what I would say, one of the things I, I like about it a lot is that um, I do feel the keys on it. Like, so I'm not even typing. You can hear them clicking a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I guess if you, this is kind of boring or, or nerdy or whatever, but like. No, it's all right. We're just hanging out. Nice. <laughs> it has like a. Yeah, I can hear that. Like a yeah. resonance to it. Like a, yeah. like a, you know what I mean? And there's something you know about you had it. Yeah, there definitely is. I need to feel things. So I agree. No, no, no. When I had that other one today, I was just like, oh, I hate this. <laughs> it's just like it, it shouldn't have been that that bad. That thing, whisper, but... quiet, yeah, keyboard just effect. Like, it just like the want, want. You know, I know. I mean, it's I supposed need... to be doing something. I think I need stimulation. I think yeah. that's what it is. I seek. Um, so I get bored really easily, and I, if, you know, maybe I just want more entertainment, more interaction, more. More, I mean, you um, want to know you did something, I think. I guess it makes me feel more engaged with whatever it is I'm doing because I feel more, there's more stimulation. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, maybe that's what I, I like about it. I'm a very, like, I'm a very visual and sensory oriented kind of person. Yeah, that makes so, sense. But, um, but anyways, like, long story long, I, <laughs> we were talking <laughs> about, I went, when I went to college, and I majored in um, molecular bio. So I got, I actually got accepted and got a scholarship to CMU. I got accepted um, and got a scholarship to Pitt. No one gets a scholarship to CMU. What do you, oh, I think, yeah. right, is that a joke? Like, well, it's just uncommon. When I, when I did my admissions tour, they're like, we don't give out scholarships, don't expect one. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, so I, I mean, like, and maybe it was because, well, one, so I was a female going into science. And so it's, it's possible that that had something to do with it. It was a partial scholarship. It wasn't a full ride. Um, but, you know, I did really well. I performed well on my ta standardized tests. I performed yeah, well, like in my, you know, um, where I was coming from. And um, I had also done some really unique things. Like I'd started clubs. And so I had like a very outgoing yeah. person. I was my school mascot. Wait, actually? Um, like, yeah. So, uh, did you yeah. you a costume or are you just you? It was a costume, but it's yes. very not PC. I don't want to make. We were the that. Raiders. We were the the Red Raiders uh, in Uniontown. So like we wore. It was crazy. So there was a male and female counterpart, and I was very much like a Pocahontas yeah. costume. So like the braids and like the we did the whole like woo woo tomahawk stuff. Like all. Yeah. Well, I mean, this was the nineties. You could never do that now. Yeah. Correct. This was yeah. yeah. So, um, but that was totally like totally at the time. At the time, that would have been fine. Nobody at the time, would have given a fuck. Yeah, nobody even brought to Second our attention class, that that was yeah. something we should consider. And I didn't know that many Native Americans. Actually, I didn't know any Native Americans growing up in Southwestern Pennsylvania. Yeah. So there's no way I could have probably, known. I probably know three at this point in my life. I mean, we've made them hard to find, fortunately. Yeah, I mean, so it was just like um, it was just part of you know the the culture at that time and of that of that experience. So, yeah. but like. That, that was, just, again, just, I, I was very active in trying, but again, I grew up in the middle of nowhere with yeah. very, like, very poor. I was in Uniontown when I was a kid. I mean, I told you my, you know, rich family story about how I was there. Yeah. 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 I mean, and then I also had very strict parents, so I was never allowed out. So the only way for me to oh. get access to social activity was through clubs. And so activities. I would just break out. That was my thing. Is I, would... I was in the middle of nowhere with no access to transportation. Ah, wow, that makes sense. Yeah, like I lived in the middle of nowhere in like a weird, like a, it wasn't even, it was called a village. Like I grew up, the, the part of town that was called, it was called Fairbank and it was called the village of Fairbank. And it was a very small, we called it a patch town because it was by, like it was uh, where Coke ovens used to be. And so they called them coal patches. Yeah. Um, And there was nowhere for me to go. Like, I mean, I we were that nine, makes sense. I, there uh, was no way to get out. I lived in a small town in New York for a little bit, and it was very much like that. Like, there wasn't really anything to do. It was, it, it felt like a prison. Like, it was just so, there was, like, nothing there, right? I mean, yeah. it was just, like. My friends called me Rapunzel, because not yeah. only was I out in the middle of nowhere, but I also was never allowed out of my home. So, just, Jeez. they, like, I was guarded under key. Because, again, I was very out. I was, I was, too. It was, yeah. it was tricky. Yeah, so... And when you're such a high achiever, like, I mean, you know, I was getting straight A pluses, breaking curves all the time, and when you get, like, one B and you're doing that, you know, your, your parents freak out, and they're just like... Mm, I had very similar experiences. Yeah. So it was, like, the report card would come out. If it was a 93%, it was like, uh-oh. Yeah, it's bad. What's happening? That's you're bad. slipping. Like, you're we, slipping. Need to, we need to be on the lookout for this. What's going on? Like, we need to get the... We need to call a parent-teacher conference. We need to figure out, like... You know, like I worked through all that weird trauma, like in my early twenties. So, but 
<laughs> yeah, I same. no longer give a shit about perfection or Correct. like I know I don't feel insignificant. I, I try to be perfectionist, but in a different way. I mean, you know, it's well, maybe not perfectionist, but I try to achieve results. But like, it's different, right? It's it's you know, you're like this is the result that's actually needed to achieve what we're trying to get done here. Not like this is the result that's obsessive and is gonna compromise right any semblance of a life or relating to these people around me right yeah, yeah or like not feeling inadequate or like you have to be great at everything like just learn you get out there and you're like oh not everybody's great at all things all the time in all ways okay and then having acceptance yeah. for that and just learning what your strengths and weaknesses are and just sort of like moving forward from there you know and if someone wants to call you out on nonsense or buy into like thing where they try to make you feel insignificant you just know they're doing that because well, they hopefully don't know any better and they haven't learned the lessons you've learned yet. Or maybe they suck and they do actually need to make you feel bad so that they can feel good. That's but either true of way, a lot of people. Either way, it's better to wish everyone to learn early, early, sooner rather than later that that's not true and that we, you know, what the truth actually is and let them just accept that they'll learn that in their own time on their own journey and yeah. wish that. Or they won't, good. but that's okay too. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. like, I mean, some people just live there forever. Like I have a lot of colleagues that are lawyers and I feel like that world in particular values competition <laughs> to the nth oh, degree. Oh yeah. You know? And so, but I mean, a lot of them are down to earth too. Like a lot of them start off like looking for a fight and then, you know, they get, you know, to be like 50, 60, 70 years old. And they're like, we're all humans here. Like, come on. It gets exhausting. Well, it's like when you see two attorneys that are going head to head and they shake hands. Hey, how you doing? You know, and then they go at it. And then afterwards they get a beer together. Um, yeah. Well, and I think that's the, uh, well, it's interesting, right? Like uh, the compartmentalization and the disassociation, the, the separation or checking your, checking your personality at the door before work, you know, it's, I, you know, it's weird. Like I, I, I don't, I, I haven't grown up in this sort of more modern generation, but like, and the generation before me, the boomers, right? It was yeah. all, there was a different level of a professional sort of expectation, right? It was like, you go to work, you do your job, you overachieve, you don't talk about your weaknesses, you check your personality at the door and like- Yeah, but you realize those people were hippies before they did that. Right, which is super <laughs> weird. Um, so like there's that. And then like there's the new generation, the younger generations, which I think are bringing a lot of their human selves to work. And they're saying, no, no, you need to nurture me as a human. Your company needs to treat me more as a, as an, you know, trigger or not trigger, um, cater more to like my intimate needs, yeah. my personal needs, my deeper needs. I shouldn't have to like go to work, only work, and then seek that separately outside and have all this like separate compartmentalization. And then I'm like Gen X in the middle. Which yeah, is sort of like same. I'm like annoyed by both. I mean, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm an elder millennial, as Eliza. I don't really like her comedy. Would say um, Eliza. Eliza Schlesinger or whatever. Like she sucks. She's not a good comic. Oh, I don't know. But she has this bit about she's like I'm a millennial, but I'm an elder millennial. It's, I'm the same age as her. So I'm just like, <laughs> you suck. You know, like you're you're not clever. Your your stuff is drawn out. Like it's just it's not well thought out. You know. It's, it's just it's it's a funny voice and it's it's nostalgia is her whole bit and I'm just like yeah, just, oh. please die in a fire I don't enjoy this it's like member berries member berries exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. member when yeah and it's just it's just not intelligently written comedy and so yeah but um yeah there's there's a lot of really good ones out right now um and the reason I bring it out is I I am also an elder millennial I'm an older millennial and uh, but I, I think I'm like one degree of separation from Gen X right I mean I, I grew up with Gen Xers I'm pretty much there um, and I think our mentalities are probably more aligned than not I mean of you know you just you know like yeah you want to be stoic and achieve results but you also want to live a life and the apathy is there where it's sort of like what does it all matter anyway man like who the hell cares like it's a lot of eye rolls <laughs> amen sister <laughs> and well well i definitely identify with that i also have to give props to the younger generations for really sometimes it's almost like are you asserting ideals that are utopian here like <laughs> is this achievable what you're asking for but then you have to say like at least you're going for it man at least you're going for like pushing the envelope with evolution and with what we should be aspiring to be as humans and actually. achieve like, I really respect it. And like, while I do grapple with the pragmatic 
nature of it right yeah, like so. sort of like, what is achievable and like how much of this is like human nature and how much of this do we need to accept about the folly of our you own kind kid. yeah <laughs> and so and like how much of it is like uh i don't want to say like displaced like uh, just you're, you're 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 spinning your wheels right and you're not going anywhere some of it is i do think it is going somewhere and i do i hope that it is i hope that it is because my generation well, I mean, is too apathetic i don't think it's a unified front i think there's a lot of different people in that generation i think some of them are overly idealistic and not gonna achieve what they're trying to aim for because it's not an achievable target i think other ones but are could it be well i think some of them are could yeah it be? like maybe what well, depends like, right like think it of, inspires me to think that it could be there's so many different people that are in that generation like you think about the ones that are like just all the way over in crazy land you know like it just it, it's fucking nuts yeah but other ones are like okay like let's just be more sensitive and incorporate how we feel into the work day and like maybe, sure. that's probably the middle ground you know it's just like well and but they're not going for middle ground and maybe that means they'll move the needle further beyond what we would anticipate or expect and maybe that's the goal what is it me, called like, example, shoot for so. the moon and grab a star or you know yeah, shoot for the stars and grab the, the, the stars or, shoot yeah. for the moon even if you miss one up amongst the stars yeah yeah like and so maybe what they're going for is actually not achievable at all but because they're going for it so aggressively as if it is it's actually going to drive the middle of the bell curve and move it along the timeline much more with much more aggression and much more momentum. And so I, I have to give them props for that. And I have to say like, that is my hope as a humanity would be able to evolve beyond what I would expect them to be able to <laughs> like, cause then, yeah, that's like, we're not going to achieve utopia, but if you can get us closer there, shit, go for it. Yeah. yeah. Do it. Like, you know, my generation was too jaded to like even try. Oh yeah, I'm guilty of that for sure. Yeah, and so like, uh, and and I don't stand behind that in the sense where I'm not. I don't think that's something to be proud of. But you know, I acknowledge, I identify with it. And it's part of the reality of like the time I grew up. But I, mean, I kind of like it. I uh, I'll be honest. Well, there's there's a comfort in sitting in a pocket. You know. Yeah. Well, and I mean, also it's just I don't know. I mean, it's it's kind of. It's funny. I mean, I guess South Park's a big part of that. You know, it's just like you kind of laugh at. We're dicks that we're assholes. Like we yeah. like sit back and like mock and we're jaded. You know what I mean? And like and and that's not that's not my best self. But I can't deny, and I've been that person more often than not. Yeah. You know, and um, but but back to I guess my point is that I love that the the these generations, the, the newer generations are saying like, ooh, no, like we should expect more. And it's like, how, why? Like, yeah. Well, I guess, I guess uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm stomping on it quickly, but the reality is I've come around to a lot of different ways of thinking that this uh, newer generation, as you put it, have come out with. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm able to be persuaded on a lot of these points. Yeah, it's elevated so, thinking and it gets us out of our comfort zones. And some of it is, some of it isn't. What I don't like is the anger and the, just the, the combative kind of thinking and i think that's one sect of it what i do like is as you mentioned the elevated thinking the you know like just think about it this way you know if somebody i think this is timeless this is this doesn't have a generation i think this is a mentality that can exist across the ages i know people in the great generation that think this way and i i think what it comes down to is if you respect the people around you and you espouse your point of view in a way where you don't tell people to fuck themselves or that they're less than you or that they don't deserve their own point of view, but you just put it across logically. I don't want to say not emotionally because some of it's emotional, but if you just put across, you know, like straightforward, yeah, straightforward and respectfully, mm -hmm. you know, then I, I think you can win allies, you know, regardless of your, your generation or your point of view. Yeah, no, I think it comes down again, it comes down to that thing we started talking about, which is like, how do you develop strong relationships by having empathy, having thoughtfulness, uh, reflecting on your intentions, taking into consideration, and growing, changing, all those things. That is, that's how we elevate ourselves as individuals, as society, as relationships, as ecosystems, um, you know, and it's, a, it's high maintenance. That's a lot of work to be doing that all the time. But it's worthwhile. I mean, if you I want to coexist, so. yeah. For me, it's a labor of love because if you just get into the practice of it, you know, it's not really that much work. You just start to think like, I just find myself naturally reflecting on like, you know, do I want to be doing this? And sometimes like I do things that aren't, I'm not this elevated person who walks around all the time and is like 
always in a tune with all the shit that I'm doing. You know, no, yeah, none of us are. No, like I slack all the time. Like I make decisions that are like, you know, well, I'll pay for this tomorrow, but I'm doing this today because like, screw it. Like it's pleasurable and fun, you know? Yeah. So I make those concessions for myself, but I allow them within reasonable boundaries, boundaries that I accept for myself and I can tolerate and live with. And then for the rest of the time, I do my best, you know? And so I was talking, who was I talking? I was talking with someone the other day and they were telling me about, they have imposter syndrome and they don't really Common. feel like they're worthwhile. They just have the self-worth struggle. I, and I don't know how I grew up, like I said, broke as a joke in like the middle of nowhere with like really socially, like I was not well acclimated or allowed to like have social time. I made a lot of social mistakes, but I never felt shame or like I wasn't worthy or good enough. I don't know that shame is the worst thing for me at this point in my life. <laughs> I think there's healthy embarrassment. There's like, we should be embarrassed of things we do wrong and poorly and we should learn from them and go, oh, I'm embarrassed by that thing that I did and I should yeah, learn from it. I mean, shame, shame. is da- shame is bad though. Shame well, makes you hide. Shame makes you deflect and be defensive. Shame makes you want to hurt others and like shame really evokes bad things. How do you differentiate shame from healthy embarrassment? Then? Very yeah. different. Yeah, so shame is, imagine like a more extreme example of and, and I'm not an authority on this, but I bet you could maybe look no, it up. No, I'm not it. either. I'm just trying to you the, know, kind of pontificate and talk about it. So I've seen people who struggle with self-worth. Shame keeps them from accepting themselves for who they are. Yeah. In all the ways that they're great and terrible. You know, like I am both great and terrible at many different times in my life, at many different times of the day, in many different circumstances. So... Uh, And I accept that because I've met other people who have been both great and terrible, right? You know, and I accept that of them. Therefore, I accept that of me. Yeah. But like, um, the original, I think the original thought or point was that like, uh, while shame, I think shame is damaging because it really attacks the person's ability to accept the ways that they are not enough because I'm not enough. Yeah. Many times in many ways. And that's okay. You might just have different definitions because the way I look at it is shame is, it's an embarrassment. It's, it's when I do something that I'm not proud of and I feel bad about it and I strive to not do that thing again in that way because I feel like that was a shortcoming. I view that as embarrassment. Yeah. Like sort of like, oops, oh, oh geez, and I need to rectify it. Yeah. Shame is um something deeper that um, I've seen. It can be people- abused for sure. Like, and maybe this is what you call shame is what I think of as like, you know, like uh, abusive shame, like, you know, like leaning in and digging in the claws and, you know, and not letting it go. Cause I've been there too, you know, where you've got some paternal or maternal figure that just slashes in, you know, and will not let you off the hook for something minor. And you're just like, right. Come on. <laughs> shame, I think attacks identity, character, self-worth. Like shame is an obstacle that you, ha- you have to remove. Right to overcome shame can't exist simultaneously while being overcome and still be present. It's when it's in front of you, you need to remove it and dissolve it. Um, For sure, and and that's a transformative experience. But mm-hmm. I mean, I would view that. I think the way I define shame is the way you define embarrassment. You know, but well, then it's just a, a word choice. Correct situation. Yeah, that's, how, that's what I think it is. Because I think uh, some people I've seen that struggled with what I define as shame have been people who have been like ashamed of who they are at their core oh that's shitty you know like having a difficult time um showing their true selves or feeling rejection and then like you know we've all been embarrassed we've all like revealed ourselves been been vulnerable and then someone did something shitty and made us feel bad and maybe they did it on purpose or maybe to be just like you know make themselves feel better or maybe they did it negligently or accidentally um but either way the way you receive it, the way you react to it, right? If you're embarrassed, it's like, oops, or, oh, like, and then you have to reflect, did, is that real? Yeah. Like, what, why did I feel that way? Did, is it because of me or is it because of them? Is it the situation? Yeah. Or is it something I need to work on? Yeah. Shame takes root and makes you feel like not only do you need well, to work on it. I would say embarrassment for me, it's, it leads to shame and that leads to change. So the way I define shame is it's, it's, a, it's a result of embarrassment which then, you know, you, you use to drive a positive change. Ah, so that's a really good point. So 
you could use it to really motivate you or it could take root and create this sort of self um deprecate this sort of self-hatred yeah a lot of people don't really they're not comfortable when they don't accept themselves and shame is one of the many reasons why a person yeah and I, w I would say it's different to not accept yourself from to say i want to make that part of me better like yeah. that's that's the part of me i don't love and i'm a little bit ashamed of it and i would like to improve that bit of me that's exactly right yeah, yeah. and so for me whenever i do something wrong i did something wrong i'm not wrong as a human yeah my being my my core you're, you're like, just a body and a series of actions that's yeah. right and so how and I, I think shame gets internalized a lot and people sort of feel they're they're ashamed of who they are they're ashamed of their identity like it takes root in their core like self-perception yeah. well, that's shitty what, what i often say is i don't mind making mistakes as long as i don't repeat that mistake yeah learning from it right yeah. and forgiving yourself when you do and just trying to do your best as you can you know and just doing the best you can yeah. man that's hard but I, w I want to make the correction before I give the forgiveness. And that's that's the value of shame, as it were. Okay, yeah. So it, motiva it motivates you so that you don't feel bad. Yeah. Well, yeah. it motivates me to make myself better so that I don't make a mistake more than once. Yeah. Yeah. I just like to not feel bad about what I've done. Like when I go yeah. out in public, a lot of people that I interact with that I've talked to about like, oh, I'm, like, I'm not good enough or I'm not as good as everybody else. Well, and there's or... certain things people will try to shame you for where I'm just like, get out of here you know you're, yeah you're wrong. you know like you have no power over me like you know yeah. like yeah like, but then there's other things where i personally feel shame because I, it violates my own sense of integrity and i'm like yeah i shouldn't do that again yeah see that's a mistake i feel like when you think about like that's like you you acknowledge a mistake you feel embarrassed that you made a misstep um uh, and so i just feel like shame is this like next level thing or yeah, if, it, feel... if it's ephemeral, not ephemeral, the opposite. If it if it's everlasting and you yeah. never let it go, then that's that's problematic, I think. Yeah, like you have to dismantle it and separate it from identity, and then, then you can be free from it. I agree. Yeah, because I think, um, like for me, one of the reasons why I don't feel shame, but I feel embarrassed about a thing I did or a, something separate from my identity is because I feel that all humans are valid in our existence. Sure. No, I agree. And so, like, as long as I do my best. And I think to demonize somebody forever because of something they did is to lose sight of that person's humanity and ability to change. And, you know, like mm -hmm. maybe they just didn't know any better. Maybe they were doing something idiotic or stupid or... We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Like, yeah. that's the great... Like, people don't know what I'm going through, like, in those moments, in each and every moment, in each and every situ situation. And so, while I don't have time to consider every human being and all their moments and all their considerations... <laughs> I can at least give them grace. I yeah. can at least give acceptance for however people show up at any given time that I'm interacting with them. I can at least be graceful in that moment to be like, well, I don't fucking know what's going on with them for real. Like, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah. So, I mean, that person could have just had a relative die. I mean, any number of things I don't know about could have happened. Any number of things. Or they could be a horrible asshole. Correct. And they, like, are really trying to make my life terrible. But, like, and I don't... everyone around them. I mean, that happens, too. Yeah. Or it's I... just not a compatible you know chemistry thing yeah yeah exactly. and all those things in equal measure and that's why i'm sort of like why would i invest in a narrative where everyone's out to get me or everyone's trying to like blow it's, it's like some it's all about me it's not about me it's Correct. all it's about a million different nuances in between that are situational and i'm just one component and they're just one component so i try not to put too much weight on either or a lot of people who meet me say like man, like, you're not really, fa like, how do you, like, and I, do you just not care? And I'm like, no, I care a lot about a lot of things. I just yeah. don't care about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also, like, you know, I don't want to get caught up in some nonsense I can't control when there's right. a million other things that I influence over that I need to be focused to make sure that influence goes in a positive way. Right. Yeah, it's funny because I've heard, uh, doing the work I do, I've heard a lot of rumors come back, like, around about weird stuff that doesn't make any sense where i'm like who even thought that up you know either about like the organizations i'm I, i'm i'm you know representing or participating in or the work we're trying to do and they're creating these like the community people in the community of our city are creating narratives all the time about like oh your organization is like that organization and therefore like you must be trying to like be that new organization and i'm like no one has said that at any point not only is that false but it's like 
stupid. It's like not yeah, even like yeah, it doesn't even make any sense. It's like, but they're to them, it's sort of like people love protagonists and antagonists. They love they love a narrative. They love and a dramatic story. That's line. the problem. Is I think some people cannot conceptualize the intricacies of what's really going on. Yeah, and so it gets oversimplified. I think there's so much. I'm stimulated by the gray area without narratives of like the simple narratives of black and white, and good and bad, and you're this and they're that. How about it's just like infinite bullshit all the time that there's so much drama that I'm always looking to like remove the narrative so I can just have peace. I just want some peace. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, can we not have battles all the time or left and right or up and down or, you know, you know what I mean? Can we I'm over here, you're over there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Can we just, like, we're all in the fog. We're all blind, just like making our way through. We're going to live and die. But it's easy to try to like fit a model and be like, that's me. I'm a so-and-so. Yeah. You're, you're this, that, the other. Exactly. Yeah. And then they feel like they have influence. So they can be like, you know. I went to such and such thing and they're just like such and such thing. And then all of a sudden everyone's listening to them talk. Yeah. And then they feel like people are listening to me talk. I'm going to keep saying that. And then like they keep saying bullshit that doesn't matter because their ego yeah. is giving them like, they're like, wow, people They've had the narrative. Yeah. yeah. And so again, these are the follies of humanity. These are just sort of like always. Universal. And that's why I always talk about like, if we can, if that person who gets sucked into that ego trap could just calm down and try and find peace and be more reflective. They wouldn't do things like that. Therefore, they wouldn't say things like that. Therefore, they wouldn't create drama like that. And we'd all be better off. That's my utopia. Yeah, and I, I agree <laughs> with you on that. Where Same everyone page. just stops running their mouth about nonsense. <laughs> what do you think of this stuff, by the way? So I like it a lot. Right? Yes. I was actually surprised how smooth it is and like yeah. creamy and buttery. Like it has a really nice flavor. I have to ask, is it like a fancy expensive brand it's or forty dollar bottle? Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah. How'd you find it? Just randomly or uh, just don't recommend it? Buddy got it for me for my birthday. And so that that was it. Uh last year. Um we got a bottle on my birthday and I was like, this is really good. I'm gonna keep buying this. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah. What a good find. They have another one called Old Scout that's uh, quite good as well. I'm going to take a picture, if you don't yeah, mind, of, of the label so I can just remember what it is. I might I might take a peek. Is it easy to find? Like Yeah, really? yeah. State stores will have it. Okay, great. You mentioned the Pittsburgh Robotics Network and what you've got coming up for that. Let's, let's dig into that. Yeah, so this is a really weird time right now. So the pandemic is sort of... We're, we're adapting. <laughs> we're accepting it. We're, we're, we're preparing ourselves to the best of our ability. So now that things are opening back up, um there's a lot of opportunity out there for community building for business development for relationship building and there's been a real deficit of it and so um the Pittsburgh robotics network is actually um you know it's been around for for many years and there are i mean amazing people who have founded it who sit on the board of it and who've been active in in things in the past Kevin Dowling, i think yes kevin's amazing jorgen Prague, like all these individuals who have been like uh randy uh, people come in and 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 out at different times and um but the the prn right now is having sort of a unique moment where it's um it's emerging in a new way than it has in the past in the past you know it's had those relationships it's had events it's had successes but we now have a different sort of funding model uh, a different uh, programmatic What's approach. What's changed, if I can ask? So, um, so Joel Reed has really been bringing some great leadership. I, I'll, I'll have to be I honest. Agree. Yeah, um, I like him a lot too. I think I think he's done some awesome stuff. Yeah, so he's bringing I think a, a different angle for the organization. One, um, the organization before existed as sort of like a grassroots, like we need this, you know, out there, and like, but it didn't have like operational staff, operational funding, dedicated like full time, you know, employment, and like yeah. also like administrative stuff. Do they have dedicated full time now? We do. That's cool. Yeah, I didn't realize that. And it's through. So Joel basically was like, "Why don't we treat this like an organization that is like a business that needs to have operational staff? Why don't we fundraise?" Like, so Joel is very commercially minded. Um, so he's sort of, you like, know, 
uh, said, well, and they were like, okay, well, why don't you show it to go ahead and do it? Like, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if you've got all this, uh, these ideas, let's see them. So, um, Mr. Ideas, man. Yeah. yeah and so he took a business approach to it. And even though it's a nonprofit and it's a community network, right. Um, he, uh, he saw the value in not only the audience and the members, but like what the needs of the community were, um, and sort of said, okay, great PRN, you have this mission let's wrap process around it but in order to do that effectively we do need staff and operational budget so through fundraising through a variety of different sources very pragmatic. yeah very and very also just that business commercial business operations yes yeah. and so and that's actually the needs of our network so the pittsburgh robotics network the pittsburgh region has as a cluster as much clout as other clusters right so boston has a significant cluster Probably. So, so, yeah, Boston, I would put it at the forefront more than Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley has somewhat of a cluster. Uh, Odense in Denmark has a cluster, um, you, you know, and then, then you see tech hubs, but not robotics and industrial autom like automation, machine, you know, mechanical automation. Um, so Pittsburgh is really, I think, not only the birthplace of that, but at the forefront of it. And it's a world class leader in that area. So we have 100 plus organizations here in our region that are uh, robotics focused robotics organizations whether it's r d or commercial businesses headquartered here that's unique not very many cities can say that boston can say it sure you know and they have an organization around building a community around the needs to foster that community make sure it stays thriving help it grow but not only it has to grow you're referring to mass robotics or or just like amalgamation of all the different things no yeah happen. no mass robotics yeah like yeah. that would be an example of another organization that supports the cluster right so it's fa it's funded right by the state it's funded by the city it's funded by all these other sources the membership yeah, it's, it's model. a cool one I, I quite like what they're doing there yeah and so the pittsburgh robotics network seeks to establish that same sort of model right but we're not copying what they're doing we're going to do sure. something that our region uniquely needs which is that visibility and promotion relationship connection building and relationship you know um sort of fostering and also spheres of influence so we're going to be implementing programs can you define spheres of influence so that's a great question um so not only do our member companies need to be more influential in industry spaces right so these other clusters right we need to interact with them more globally but also within our own cluster we need to make sure our leaders are interacting with each other and like making sure they're showing up to speak at conferences, making sure they're going to the industry conferences or submitting when they do a call for speakers or call for abstracts, um, making sure that they are appearing on the world stage and influencing and being voices of this, this industry sort of like, you know, takeoff that's, that's been happening now and is not is ramping up and, and is well established. So we have amazing leaders in Pittsburgh and we need to not be so quiet and humble. So we seek to activate those leaders. We seek to create programs to not only get them to know each other, but make sure like we bring awareness to like, hey, these industry conferences are coming up. Why the hell are you not speaking there? Did you not submit an abstract? Do we have to open the abstract submission form for you and submit it on your behalf? Like, <laughs> so we need to do a little bit more of that. Yeah. But we are also cultivating a few more things on a higher level. Uh, we are gonna be creating special industry forums and industry groups that will be working on thought provoking outcomes right and sitting at the table amongst their peers right and then when we go to an international conference or when we host here in pittsburgh an international conference the outcomes like the from those are yeah and we're going to be doing that um the outcomes do you have from, a date or is that not we do not have a date okay. we do not have a date but it is something we are working toward yeah so look toward look i mean look in the next 12 to 16 months to see announcements of many types you know that that being one of them yeah, so keep my eyes open that yeah. sounds awesome but bringing leaders together and making sure that they recognize that they that they're um putting themselves in the right places within industry to make sure like pittsburgh has so much going on not just from an ip and r d focus but from our commercial business success yeah and we should be putting that forward we should be unapologetically taking stage across, you know, from a global perspective and having a voice and saying, yeah, I'm the leader, I'm doing this, 
I have a perspective. I have a knowledgeable, experienced perspective on this and it's going to shape industry. And I'm not just doing that for my company. I want to do that here in the industry. So we are working to create and establish a network that will have that ability to amplify influence, right? Not just locally, but globally in industry. That's cool. Yeah. And Rome wasn't built in a day. So no, no, I mean, and I, I'll buy that. And, you know, I want to see this all happen. I mean, I'm a proud Pittsburgher. I like living here a lot. And um, I mean, I say proud because I keep coming back. It's my choice to be here. Yeah. And so, I mean, I've worked in the Bay Area, Los Angeles, Boston, and Pittsburgh's my fucking my place. I think Pittsburgh is, um, we're tired of hearing it's like, a, oh, it's the best kept secret or like, oh, yeah, like, don't tell it. Like, no, tell people. Let's tell people we've got a robotics cluster. We've got a revitalized tech ecosystem. We have a great cost of living. We have a unique town. It's unique. Let's not compare it to Silicon Valley. Let's not compare it to New York. Let's not compare. You know what I mean? I mean, there's nothing wrong with comparing, but you know, we're not, we're not them. We're our own thing. That's right. Like Pittsburgh is its own unique region and it has like pros and cons and let's not create a narrative, right? Where we're like, compare you know who's better who's worse like i agree with you on no that. drama yeah like just evaluate it for what it is it has value and it has strengths and weaknesses and the strengths happen to be in industrial manufacturing robotics you don't and, even know <laughs> right. and like it does happen to be a pretty pretty affordable and neat place to live yeah i i completely agree and i mean there is a reason i keep coming back here and it's that pittsburgh is great yes yeah. A good place to run a business it's a good place to do business it's a good place to recruit and um i mean i i really like living here i really like working here so. yeah yeah so but it is it is exciting we do have a lot of things coming back up and i think the pandemic sort of um well, you know, to everybody it did it really put us in a deficit for a lot of things um from a business development relationship development um perspective the and, silver lining though is that that's not just us i mean that's all those hubs you talked about as well that's right the whole world yeah. the world was shut down in different ways and different aspects in many ways it's kind of interesting that everybody got traumatized at once globally it's a truly unique yeah uh event that will be in the books yeah for I mean, sure for sure yeah i mean like it's, it's weird but like you know my mind goes to like world war ii it's like maybe the last time like everybody experienced a collective trauma i mean I, I, it's probably more recent than that that something's happened yeah i mean there's i mean it's interesting that something, how rare is it that something ripples across our entire little blue marble? Yeah. You know what I mean? And touches all it's aspects not common. of it. No, not at all. To have something like make. Because you remember like SARS, where we were like, that doesn't affect us. That's just people in Asia. That's yeah. right. <laughs> that's right. Like, yeah, like we, it would be geographically yeah. sort of referred like, to. Yeah, it. that's weird to see that on TV. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now we're wearing the masks. Right. <laughs> Listen, I love the masks. I will be totally honest with you. Like, I'm not against them either. I love, like, when I go to the store and I see everyone wearing masks, I'm so happy people spit and mucus is <laughs> absolutely confined to their their own, like, body and face, like, and yeah. not spraying all over. I me. think that'll keep going, probably. I mean, I don't know, but, like, my prediction is, like, we'll probably keep seeing, like, no coughing in public, masks in the supermarket. Yeah. You know. I think so, yeah. And I've traveled. The last time I went to Europe, um, w w was a few years back. I got um, like walking pneumonia or some. I don't. I got deathly sick, and I actually yeah. had. I was in. I was in Venice, and I had to see a doctor, and they prescribed me antibiotics and steroids because I was getting worse and not better, and like I couldn't move. Yeah, I had a one hundred and four degree fever. Like I was ill. Did the meds help you? Yes, one hundred percent. Within, it wasn't viral within 48 hours i started to feel better although steroids and antibiotics steroids alone will just they'll make you feel better you know what i mean yeah but whatever i was sick with um it was uh devastating and i remember and I, it was right after the plane ride right and yeah. this happened the last time i went to europe like 25 years ago Jeez. like i got i actually got walking pneumonia and had to walk myself into a hospital in france and couldn't speak the like i was like trying to keep i was like i just wanted them to be like am i dying can you just tell me if i'm dying just i just if That's i'm not dying it. i'll go home and sleep yeah. in the <laughs> hostel like i don't care yeah. but um you know uh but yeah so i i say more right? <laughs> but when you have only a few days like we've taken i had a 10-day vacation 
And four of those days, like I missed out on seeing an entire city. I was bedridden for like a couple days. I felt like just complete another crap, you know? And like, I lost out on those four days out of 10 because I had like really, we, we put a lot of thought into this vacation. And so I thought, I'm going to wear a mask next time. And I remember I was a road warrior. I remember kind of like in my mind being like, thinking people were dramatic when they were wearing masks traveling. Now, yeah. now I will not hesitate to wear a mask going on a plane. And nobody's going to look at you twice. I mean. Right. And I don't care if they do. No shame. No yeah. shame. I will yeah. feel no embarrassment or shame. I'll just wear it and be like, I'm wearing this. I don't care about what you think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that's totally fine i mean that's probably healthy honestly that i mean that's just one less thing to worry about yeah because it's too much of a risk like we, like i said you have those precious few days and you have a whole trip planned out and if you get really sick like how often do people just get to go to europe you know what i mean like, yeah i mean maybe every two years for me i get to go to europe or some new place part of the world i haven't been to yeah and like you take the time off from work you step away you make you make great arrangements yeah yeah for and, it. i mean you said now i respond to you have other people to do your your position basically you delegate different parts of your role that's right and you check in even when you're over there i mean at least i do and yeah then, and so it's a big deal so uh, you know i yeah so i've learned a lot i think we've all learned a lot of lessons about public health and just you know like wear a mask who gives a crap like it's not dramatic it's actually pretty if you think about it pretty pragmatic yeah so but we'll see like i'm really i am glad to see that people are getting vaccinated and we can return to in person those business development those yeah. relationship things like even just this yeah this is nice i haven't seen you in forever yeah it's been a while i mean yeah. we see each other on the computer but it's it's always like a, a weird vibe you know it's like wish we could just be seeing each other and hanging out it is different in person yeah it is i mean it's slightly like I, let me it's see. not that different so like one thing that i've noticed that i've kind of resisted is everybody wants to have a lunch now i'm just like look yeah, i don't I want to spend that money yeah. like just give me like like how important is this like I, i'll do it every now and then but it's just like come on like i don't want to spend 40 dollars just to sit down with you when we could do this via zoom well i think people achieve just... 90 five to 98 percent of the same result so this is the tricky part right because now i have a hybrid meeting schedule where like some everyone's asking for the lunch and coffee dates because same, same. yeah and i think they're asking for it because we can now and Correct. we're and, and they're they're a joy but, but it's think, just it's frivolous spending and that's what i've realized you know that's a great thing that's come out of this is i'm like i could save thousands of dollars a month <laughs> right not going out not everything has to be a lunch or coffee or hot happy hour right yeah. so i think having that discernment level like and it's not about importance like i don't want people who have proposed lunch or coffee meetings with me to think that i like don't think they're important enough it's not that it's like whatever day of availability that we were able to come up with know that like i'm juggling a combination of zoom meetings and in-person meetings that day so it's more about logistics and also how much work do i have to accomplish during the pandemic, I got to work exclusively all the time for my laptop, which I hated. Yeah. Like it was like a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. But also my productivity was much higher. Now that I now that I have meetings all over the place, I've got to like drive. Like I was on the south. This is the second time I'm on the south side of the city. Wait. And th Today. Since, okay. Got it. This Today. morning I was over at the High Line. And so, and then I was over in Lawrenceville, right? And then I like, but this morning in between, before I went to the High Line, I was working from home. Are you doing was, car meetings? So, no, I'm not, I try not to do car meetings. I end up doing them more than I would like. I hate car meetings when they happen to me on the other side, when other people are in their car and they're having a meeting with me. And, um. It makes me feel bad about it. It's, see, it's, see I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed. Well, <laughs> and I, it's not a horrible thing. I personally don't care for it, yeah. but I have done it in the past and I try to avoid it now. Um, so I'll just turn my camera. Why can't we just have a phone? If I'm in my car, you don't, we don't need a video on. I can, I can just, we can just have a phone call. You don't need to see that I'm like sitting there in my car. Cause I feel like when someone's sitting in their car, they're not at rest. They're not focused on me. I can tell they're like squeezing me in between things, you know? And like, for that reason, I think that I would much rather them just postpone the meeting or just take a call and be like, Hey, let's have a chat, you know, like. Like, I also don't think we all need to turn our video cameras on all the time. Yeah. We got used to that in the pandemic, and I think we need to de yeah, definitely. That. I definitely feel the need to do that a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the other thing that was nice about that, though, is, like, it does get you to shower. <laughs> I don't know about you, but, like, I like I can just uh, 
put a ponytail in and be like put some dry shampoo on and like nobody needs you're not there you can't smell or detect what's really going on <laughs> so like if i put some jewelry on it looks as if oh, i'm man. fresh you know yeah, doing the same thing. <laughs> so you can fake it on the virtual meetings yeah like the in-person stuff i'm definitely like i gotta go shopping i gotta get a new wardrobe i gotta get myself together nice shoes oh thank you yeah yeah, uh, you're welcome. Well, they were going to summer, and these are more of a winter boot, but yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, my my comment was more like, I gotta have nice shoes, but I do like your shoes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> you're welcome. But anyways, I really, I, I appreciate being able to do this. I think I appreciate these moments where you get to do, when you have the time and ability to sit down I with someone in I appreciate you coming in and taking the time to do this. Yeah, it's fun. I think yeah. you do a great job. Like, I think the work you do is great. I think this podcast is great. And, uh, Trying you know. Trying my darndest. <laughs> yeah. So, I hope more people should listen. Tune in. to the... Subscribe today. Yes. <laughs> if you like this, you want to see what you like, smash that subscribe button. And you gotta check it out. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to other episodes. Stay tuned. More to come. So. We got people doing great stuff in a lot of different industries, and uh, <laughs> we're gonna keep doing it. I mean, it's basically my friends from all over the Roblox industry. <laughs> yes, and I think those are interesting conversations to have. Thanks. So, well, good. Well, I'll continue to support what you're, the work you're doing, and I'm happy to participate in any way I can. Yeah. Thanks. Anything else you want to plug before we call it? No, just um, if you yeah, if people aren't from if you if you're local to the region and you want to check out Build Four One Two Tech, um, it is an amazing networking organization for uh, Pittsburgh technology professionals and leaders. Um, very cool. It's more of like a West Coast vibe networking here in Pittsburgh, um, where you can just casually get to know each other as humans and just share and care. Uh, about what's going on in technology, right? It's a lot of fun. I, I really enjoy that org as well. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, it's because I think it's tech is changing so fast. The only way for us to learn Full is to tech. immerse each other. <laughs> and we do it every month. We have monthly gatherings. So um, and they're super easy to get to. And um, uh, hundreds of people, hundreds of people flock to them. So uh, we'll be returning to in person in July. <laughs> so I've got lots of plans. So uh, yes. <laughs> so I think it'll be fun, and, and we'll, we'll see. So it'll be good. cool. Well, yeah, that's a perfect note to end on. Thanks for coming in, Jen. Pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks so much. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button, or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. But we're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.